This episode of Skirmish Supremacy is brought to you by Reformation Brewery, the official beer of your game night. And uh, we'll just wait there for it go. to start doing stuff. There it is. It says live there on my side. It does say live. Nick, does it say live on your side? It says live! Yes. All right. Well, Mike, I believe that uh, <laughs> I told you I was going to hold you up to something. You said you were going to hold me up to something. Yeah. Hold. So, uh, what you said. We, we, were, we were going to be blessed <laughs> by a, uh, a freestyle rap from Mike Tunez. It's got a, I don't know. There's no... There's no beat. There's nothing. I don't know. If yeah, I, I never said I was giving you that. <laughs> <laughs> it's been too long of a day for me to attempt a freestyle rap right now. But, okay, um, fine. <laughs> catch me on another time. I'll give you a rain check on that one. <laughs> okay. So we all heard it here, folks. Mike Tunez will have a freestyle rap by the next time he comes on an episode. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, Mike never came back on the show. <laughs> yeah, <it's just laughs> never again. Easy way out. <laughs> For some reason, my contract was just immediately up from Firelock Games. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks, welcome back to episode. What is this, Nick? One twenty-eight. I think so. Yeah, one twenty-eight. One twenty-eight ish of skirmish supremacy. Again, we can count. And <laughs> as you just heard, uh, Nick and I are joined by Mike Tunez, uh from Firelock Games. We're actually going to be talking tonight about the some of the tweaks that he's done to Oak and Iron, and the fact that the Kickstarter is coming out soon. And we're also going to be talking about the new. Highly anticipated quartermaster program from Firelock Games. That's right. Yay! All those things. Yes. So, Mike, I, can't I know really you talk ha- about any of that. Though is the only problem. You can't talk about the one. I can't talk about any of that yet. Is the only problem. Yeah. So you know, this is going to be just a wasted episode. But the point of it is, is that Mike is on here tonight just just to sit there with a cup of coffee and mm-hmm. complain about how long his day was. But Mike, how long was your day today? Uh, so what time is it now? Eight twenty-four. So I'm on. I'm on um, thirteen and a half hours. Yeah, sounds about right. Sounds about right. Because uh, you've been a machine lately with everything going on. You know, obviously the the, you know, for the folks out there that are still waiting on some of the stuff for no peace beyond the line, you shouldn't. But it it took a while to get it out there, and they they busted their ass to get it out there to everybody. And it is now going. To, it's now in distribution. Um, yep. So you should be able to get all of the new stuff from no peace beyond the line through your local game store. And if you don't, um walk in there and talk with either the manager or the owner with a bat in your hand and make that happen. Cutlass is more appropriate, but I suppose the battle work too. If you need yeah. To. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you grab whatever you can is what it comes down to. If you got a cutlass, um, put, yeah, send send us a photo either on Facebook or Instagram mm-hmm. and <laughs> make sure you record, tag. Screen. For the record, we don't condone actual um, violence against game store owners. Yeah. <laughs> there there we go. Yeah. There we go. I, I would <laughs> Not to be tagged in anything that has uh, <laughs> threatening or harming game store employees or owners. No, no, they're very important. We need them. Yes, we do everything <laughs> wrong on this podcast. No, uh, yeah, don't listen to me. I'm an enabler, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so it, either way, it should all be out there. But November 7th will be the official Kickstarter launch of Oak and Iron, your 1 600 scale naval yep. game. That's right. That's right. If I if I survive that long, but yes, if you survive I, that long, I anticipate being able to at least make it to November seventh. So, yes. um, so yeah, it's coming out on November seventh. We've been working hard to try to get it as um, as done, polished, and put together as possible by that time. Uh, the idea being that as soon as we wrap up, since since production is not in our hands on this one, um, we'd like to have it wrapped up and out to the printers. Pretty much almost right around the time we start closing up the Kickstarter. So we can have as little delay as possible. So right yeah. now the game is, uh, for the most part, pretty sewn up. We just need to kind of, uh, there's some characters to be worked on, some extra factions. to, And then, uh, you know, and that's just a matter of most of the extra factions. Uh, I think that's going to probably end up being stretch goal stuff uh, that we can, if as much as I'm able to put together for now. But uh, otherwise, it'll, they'll be out eventually. <laughs> Uh, so 
once, but yeah, for the most part, it's now it's now that the, once the Kickstarter stuff all left from here, and uh, we were able to catch up with distribution orders, which I I believe we just did today, in fact. <laughs> so, uh, but still, that was that I was I didn't have to be super hands on with that. We have enough guys to handle that, thankfully. But <clears throat> thanks to that, I have been able to work on the game a lot. Yes, um, during the summer, between Beast of War and all the cons and everything else. It was, there was just so much running around back and forth. I didn't, I was kind of worried that I wouldn't be able to get enough done, but really the last couple of weeks I've been able to hit it hard, do a lot of development, a lot of play testing, and uh, I got it to a place where I'm really happy with it right now. Um, we even changed, we, I mean, we even changed the dice, and I just got the prototypes in today, actually. Nice. So, yeah, I know you and I have been talking about the dice, and I think you actually hinted at it on a couple of the pages on Facebook for those that are uh, belonging to some of the Blood and Plunder, and even like if you're on the Oak and Iron group, but mm-hmm. may have missed it, uh, you changed the dice to D8s, correct? Yep, that's a, official at this point. That We did switch the D, up to a D8. I, uh, I initially wanted to do a D10, but that's for, because we're using symbols on the dice and some proprietary dice. I felt like the D10 didn't really have enough space on it. And then realistically... The main reason was the math just works really well on the D8 for what I'm trying to do, which is the main reason I moved away from the D6. Mm-hmm. Um, because, because it was using the symbols, I thought the D6 would be better because it just had a bigger face. You could see it easy. And the math was working okay with the way I initially had the rules. But the D8 actually just, because of the extra percentages, or rather the, the you know, the extra, the, the you know, the extra faces on the top. Yeah, the extra <laughs> spread. The extra spread of of, uh, of of probability, right? Exactly. So, I can I can do this. I promise. <laughs> the extra spread of probability. It actually ended up giving me the opportunity to simplify a lot of mechanics in the game. So a lot of things that would involve maybe multiple faces that didn't make as much sense and stuff were are a lot simpler now to understand. And the probability just sits at a nice place for everything. It's almost exactly where I want everything. So. It was a uh, D8s or something. So now we have a game with D8s and D10s and no D6s. So okay, perfect. We have the D6s actually. It isn't, that game's not on. Yet, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're almost we're covering a good spread of the game, and now we just need one with D12s maybe. But. <laughs> yeah, there you go. The most metal dice there is out there. <laughs> but uh, awesome. So let me ask you this: with D8s, does that mean that when Nick and I play each other again, that we'll actually be able to hit each other? No, absolutely okay. not. Not in your yeah. case, anyway. No other people will be able to, but not you. Guys. Right. Right. Yeah, so, no, yeah, yeah. no yeah. So, we, we just, you know, <laughs> play test your game and can't shoot each other. Yeah, at all. <laughs> so the way so, it breaks down is uh, it's – so now at long range, which is cannon – we call cannon shot, that's um, – so now you've got a 25% chance per die of hitting. Okay. At musket, ra- at musket shot, which is medium range, you have uh, a 50% chance – and then when you when you bump into pistol shot, which is like right up close to each other, you've got a seventy five percent chance. So those numbers work really nice, and it gives you um, and positioning and your and your distance from other ships matters a lot, especially for some factions who get bonuses at longer ranges and others at closer ranges on certain cards and things like that. So it all it's all working really well. I'm really happy with where it's at. I'm excited nice. to. We're hoping to do some some video streams of it of some gameplay in the next week or so, if we can get the if we can find the time. <laughs> so yeah, but um, I think we I think we'll be able to get something up before the Kickstarter, at least one video. We always try to we've been trying to do some for Blood and Plunder for a while, but unfortunately, our entire building was just every every play space was converted into a packing station, so we can get stuff out as fast as possible. Right. So, but now that we've finally cleaned that all up, hopefully we can start doing some more videos here in house and. <clears throat> excuse me things like that awesome so the the symbols again like i'm trying to remember exactly so it, it was is cannon musket uh pistol and then there was critical and that's still there right so yeah you've got a critical face which is a skull and crossbones you've got a cannon you've got muskets you've got pistols and you've got uh you've got swords for crew and you've got uh sails on there okay. so when you're shooting at at cannon, whenever you're shooting, a skull is always a hit. A critical is always a hit, no matter what range. And when you're at cannon range, you hit on the skulls and on the cannons. And at musket range, you add muskets to that. So at musket range, you're hitting on skulls, cannons, and muskets. 
and then that pistol shot, you're hitting, you're adding pistols, so you're getting a lot more. And there's a uh, two of the faces have muskets, two have pistols, and then everything else has one of each the, of each of the other ones. Okay. Cool. So it gives so it a nice spread. <laughs> okay, awesome. So yeah, it's yeah, that's definitely a little bit different of a spread than when Nick and I played, which might explain why we sucked. But um, no, no, it's just uh, bad dice. Uh, but yeah, so. And I know that you've been working hard on adding new cards and, like you were saying, new factions into the game. Right. Um, what I believe when Nick and I played, the only thing that there was was unaligned French, English, and um, Spanish. I think it was all you had at the time. Uh, probably. Possibly I, Dutch. It may, it may have been less than that, actually. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, it was it was less than that since we didn't get to play it at all, but it was there, there was some <laughs> outlines of it. Right. I think you guys got to play a game, didn't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we, it game. yeah, we just yeah. sucked at it like horribly. Yeah, yeah, we uh, couldn't. We, we could not do anything to stuff. each other the whole time. <laughs> no, no. I mean, we did stuff. That's why we ended up all beat up. We just couldn't actually sink a ship. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't finish anything to save our lives. Like, of course, we, we had uh, very aggressive quitters. <laughs> of course, you uh, you did really just you blew your best chance of sinking a ship when you know. You were like, all right, Nick's ship is almost dead. I'm just going to start sailing away, and I'm just going <laughs> to keep sailing away. I don't that's, know where I'm going, but I'm just going away. That's one of the fun parts about the game, I think. It's kind of like in, um, in games that are, that are sort of on rails like that, where, you, where, you're, where you're moving ships and there's momentum and stuff like that, and people kind of lose track of where they're at, and they start crashing into each other. So it's tons of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it, it definitely was that. It was <laughs> was tons of fun, especially yeah. once that ship that was almost sunk um, and should have just sailed off the map managed to get really lucky. It repaired just enough stuff that I could start shooting him again. Yeah, that's why I <laughs> sailed away because I like the way my dice were rolling. I was like, nope, I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to leave you <laughs> sit here in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys, you guys played that in what? That was in uh, Nashcon, actually. Nashcon. Yeah. Which is when was that? Was that June? June, okay. Yeah, so you guys were, that was a pretty early version, because I really had it, the version, so I ex, I kind of started experimenting with ideas around uh, March. So June was where I f- you guys had, like, the first version of what the game is now, but man, they, it's, it's actually gone through quite a bit of tweaks since then. <laughs> okay. So, um, it's definitely, it's... It's a little more bloody. It's still pretty difficult to sink a ship, as it should be, realistically. But it's easier to get a crew to strike out. Um, that was one of the things, is that it was a little too easy to get rid of all the fatigue before, when you guys played. Yeah, so I, I kind of like, kinda, kinda thought that was a thing, because I know that like at one point, mm-hmm. again, I wasn't killing anything. I was successfully hitting Nick, but then like the next round, he's like, and none of my crew cares anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I just shot the bejesus out of like your ship. Yeah. It's a, it's a much slower climb back up. You can, okay. you can still do it, but it's much more difficult, and you're not going to come back 100%. So, because um, fatigue was supposed to represent a mix of casualties and, and uh, suppression and everything else on a ship. Right. But it was a little too easy to get rid of it once you built it up to a high level. So you can kind of take a, a beating and kind of just turn out of formation, take two turns to rally a couple times and jump back in. And that was so... That's changed. That is definitely not no longer the case. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All the mechanics for everything else is pretty similar, but it's um, a lot of those just little tweaks that go a long way at the end of the day. And ship classifications have stayed the same, right? <laughs> like you've got uh, the first, the first through the six yeah. uh, ship, or first through the six ship, uh, sixth rate ships right. in the line, and then uh, galleons on down. And I think you said that like you're not even really touching. Uh, anything smaller than a sloop, and even a sloop, if you're playing against like larger ships, is just going to get blown away. For the time being, yeah. So one of the things that's um, one of the ways I designed it is that when you play a game, you're going to set it up, and there's really almost four different levels you want to play at. So there's there's two main ones, which is squadron, which is a, your standard game. You have one squadron of ships, right? So you've got anywhere between uh, three and ten ships, and then uh, but it's a single squadron, right? And uh, on that level, you're going to have um, if three different levels. So you've got like a small coastal raiding party, right? And that represents like buccaneers and coast guards and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you're pretty limited to the you, – you're definitely not taking any ships with a line in there. Uh, you could take some rated frigates, but that's about as high as you'll be able to go. So a sloop will do fine in that situation. 
Um, and then you'll have in the right in the middle where you can kind of take a little bit of everything. You can take maybe a third rate ship of the line and not be, uh, and still have enough ships. Uh, and then the higher rating, which is still single squadrons, but you could have bigger ships like first and second rates. Right. Then the second one is fleet mm-hmm. scale, which in, in fleet in a fleet game, you're playing three squadrons at least. So you, you each have three squadrons. And at that point, you're playing on a big table and you've got at least nine ships. So that's where it stands at present with that. Okay, cool. <clears throat> and did you add any new ship classifications in since the last time we talked, or is it still the same ones that they were before? No, I've got some ideas for some, but I, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to them just mm-hmm. because of the sculpting time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> they will definitely be in probably after the Kickstarter. Um, one of the things we want to do with this game too is that because we can kind of just do uh, box expansions and then from there create um, either packs or individual dishes of ships, we haven't we have to see how that all turns out. But <clears throat> we could do a lot more factions faster than we could for Blood and Plunder. Since right. really all you need is a handful of ships and, a, and some cards and you can produce a whole new faction. Which So because of that, we wanted to take this more of a global game. So eventually I'd love to do like Corsair, uh, Barbary Corsair ships and and uh, and fleets of the um, Indian Mogul and stuff like that. So, Right. So, it, yeah, because again, a lot of that because of the fact that, you know, we're talking one 600 scale ships compared to individual right. models, right? Yeah, it's it's much easier to manage and produce on that level. So you can you can jump that scale where if you'd have tried to do that with right. Blood and Plunder right now. <laughs> man. Yeah, so with, with Blood and Plunder, we could do... Uh, so two models, two, two sets of two units rather for blood and plunder would be enough to do an entire new faction of completely different types of ships in Okanai. So right. that's one of the exciting things about this game is that we can do so much with, um, with, with minimal resources. So it's a game that we can produce alongside blood and plunder without compromising, compromising either one. Yes, that's very true. And of course they have a time, which we can, Hasn't been. We haven't fully tested that part out yet, but that's that's one of the things I'm working on now. Soon is the tie-in. I'm thinking about doing uh, thinking about doing uh, a tie-in where you can play side by side, so you could have a fleet battle going on supporting uh, a land action, and you could bombard from the sea if you're able to get in there, and you could land extra troops and stuff like that. So that could be a pretty fun thing for like big bigger con games and stuff like that. Oh yeah, especially you know some of the tables that we've seen at like Siege of Augusta, Historicon, and some of the others where they're talking like these big sixteen foot long tables yeah. or whatever. <laughs> like that at that point, yeah, you could be like, okay, this four by four section over here is oak and iron, and by the way, right. everything that happens at oak and iron can affect this big twelve by six over here. Exactly, <laughs> and that's what's cool about since both games play in a reasonably small area, even Blood and Plunder, you can play on a regular six by four table. At with like 800 points easily, you know, yeah, and that's a pretty massive battle. And you could have still room for a uh, three by four or four by four area for an oak and iron game that's that's going that's happening alongside of it, right? Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, so I, I know that uh, when Nick and I played, like, we well, I can answer for myself, I'll let Nick answer for himself, but I really liked the concept of like the activation cards. And one of the things that I know we didn't really do during our, our play is that um, there were certain cards that we had on our hands that were, mm-hmm. you know, part of the initiative were like a one shot use. Right. But um, I think we were, we were just kind of using them kind of repeatedly as we played on a, on a few of them, just because you wanted to see how some of them worked. But it, I know that you've, you've talked a lot more about like adding some more of those one shot style right. mm-hmm. cards, kind of like, you know, with the unaligned, where you know the moment that you raise the black, then you know it, it'll cause fit, or it has the potential of causing more fatigue on another ship because they're right. like, oh shit, pirates, compared yeah. to just you know, exactly, yeah, it's a one shot intimidation card, yeah. And I think yeah. that one, um, if you watched, if you had the chance to watch the Beast of War video, it's uh, we used the pirates and we did had we had all those cards on there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the pirates are really fun, and but they won't they, the pirates will fit into the first two categories I said where you have. Uh, <laughs> where you yeah. have smaller engagements, so definitely don't. You definitely don't have fleets of pirate ships engaging uh, ships of the uh, uh, or you know naval ships of the line. They were they were not about that. That's for sure. No, so. because the moment <laughs> the naval ships of the line started showing up, that's when the golden age of piracy died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty true, actually. 
So yeah, because that that's there's a big difference between like, hey, look at this, I've got a light frigate, and I'm this you know big swaggering pirate that holds like 14 guns, and the ship of the line rolls up. It's like that's cute. That's what <laughs> I have that on one deck. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we do leave room for pirates like Black Bart and stuff to take larger ships of the line, or mm-hmm. not really ships of the line. They weren't, but big merchant ships that are outfitted like ships of the line, right? Like, so they'd be right. they'd be able to take uh, so. Guys like that will be able to take some bigger ships, but they're still not going to stand up to uh, a naval force. No, there's no way. So, but we do have the game does offer does offer the opportunity for the person who wants to say, "Hey, what would happen if a bunch of pirates just went up against you know the English Navy? Let's just see what would happen." <laughs> so yeah, if pirates got their crap together, started sailing in line and <laughs> and yeah. uh, signaling each other and operating like a, like a navy, like in like what like what Flint wanted to see happen in Black Sails, right? So <laughs> right. Well, I mean, to his defense and Black Sails, Flint was technically a member of the English Navy. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah, so um, when I was in the Navy as an admiral, this worked really well. And all the pirates like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, this doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like I could get killed doing that. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I can't just go rob this Piragua over here and call it a day? <laughs> right. Yeah. Awesome. So what other changes have come to the game? Like I know you said you talked more about expanding it, you know, farther globally. Um, you right. know, obviously the last time we played, we only had the few factions, but uh obviously you've got all the factions for blood and plunder. And then what else have you kind of thrown in there that will be built into the Kickstarter? So not a lot has changed really, um, aside from little things just like adjusting the ranges of the movement and the angles of turning and stuff. So so like when you played, I think all the turning had the same angle. Yes. Uh, so now, if you're moving faster or slower, you gotta you gotta sl- your your turning angle isn't as sharp. Okay. So um, so there's uh, considerations to be made and uh, more considerations to be made on the individual speed of your ships. But other than that, it's mostly been just tweaking what you played pretty much. Uh, a lot of stuff got moved. Well, here's actually a big one that because a lot of people have commented on this. A lot of the stuff has been moved onto the card. So we were gonna originally do those tokens on the back of the base. And we did them for the, some prototypes to try it out. But at the end of the day, it ended up moving the ships around too much. And even though it looked cool on the table because you could see exactly how much damage everything had and it kept it organized on the ship, at the end of the day, it's not proven popular. And it's kind of fallen out of favor even here. So it, we're going to probably move away from that. Did and, you find that putting the stuff on the bases, like every time you did it, it shifted the ships a little? And Yeah, and you could do it. If you did it carefully, you wouldn't shift the ship. But who wants to... You know, yeah. you don't want to be uh, fidgeting with that too much. So yeah, you kind of um, want to be able to slap it down and go. Right. So we got the damage track and the fatigue track and all the other stuff you could possibly need to track on the ship card. Uh, so you can throw it on a sleeve. The ship cards are tarot card size, so just get tarot card size sleeves. And, um, you can throw it in there and just mark everything with a marker, or we you know have a little numbered tokens, so you can just lay those on the card or next to the ship or whatever you want to do. So you've got options. Awesome. So that's one big once one big change that's uh, but that's more of a component thing it doesn't really affect the mechanics at all right uh, so the, but the mechanics have held up for the most part the core of it since you've played um, nothing significant that I could think of it's hard to think exactly what I had at that time but <laughs> yeah it's hard for me to comment on a lot of it because I know that a lot of the stuff I tried to do failed so um, <laughs> I mean that's that's just what you always tried to do. Yeah, I know. Which is usually just trying to break a game. Yes, yeah. this is very true, and it did not work at all. <laughs> if anything, the game broke me. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, because I, I tried doing a little bit of everything when we were playing, where it was just like, you know, I know this is not good strategy, but let's see how it works. <laughs> and I couldn't do anything anyway. So, so one, thing, yeah. one thing that we did change, actually pretty significantly since then, uh, was critical hits and boarding. Um, so critical hits used to be a deck of cards that you draw stuff from. Mm-hmm. Um, so now it's if if you if anybody who's on Beast of War video will see it, but so what it is now is we just kind of have a super simple chart, so that if you roll a if you roll a skull, that's a potential critical if it doesn't get canceled by the ship's fortitude. So you re-roll all the all the skulls you got that weren't canceled, and if you roll another skull, what it does now this is a slight change from the Beast of War video, is it actually drops your ship's fortitude by one because now the way wow. to sink a sh- to now to to sink a ship. <laughs> It's got to lose all of its um, whole boxes, and it's got to have its fortitude to reduce to zero. So it takes 
So it makes ships tough, but not invincible. Um, Because the Avis have trouble getting that right balance between too easy to destroy a ship and too hard. And I now I finally got in a good place. So I think it's it's sitting at a pretty realistic place that isn't um, probably a little more killy than is realistic, but just enough to keep the game going and not make it seem like too arcadey at the same time. Right. So, um, so if you roll skull, you get a you lose a, you, your fortitude drops by one. If you roll a crew. A crew, which is a little a little sword on the new dice, that's a extra point of fatigue. And if you get a sail, that drops your sail setting by one, which represents rigging damage. Um, now each of those things has a an opportunity to kind of uh, to get have a more significant effect. So, for example, if you get so if you roll two of any of those, so let's say I get three on cancel date, I roll three of them and I get two. Of any one of those symbols, if that happens, uh, if you get two skulls, the ship it's like a powder detonation. So it's like a, it's some kind of catastrophic damage, and the ship immediately you just lose all your health, and your ship immediately becomes crippled, <clears throat> and you lose okay. a point of fatigue. So it's actually possible if you hit a ship really hard, it's actually possible to one shot it. <laughs> right. Very very unlikely. It has actually has not happened yet. Yeah, I was going to say because you're <laughs> saying that you need you need skulls, and then you have to roll skulls again on the skull dice, and you need at Correct. least two. Exactly. So, yeah, so that's is good. So when it happens, it's it's good. It's very epic. So, um, so you got that. Then you've got uh, if you get two crew dice, if you've got a commander on your card, if you've got a commander or an admiral card or something like that, that card is actually destroyed. So you've killed somebody important, basically, mm-hmm. or injured them or whatever. Uh, and then if you get two of the sails, uh, so not only do you get your sails dropped twice, but your ship something important on your ship gets damaged and you temporarily lose control and your opponent gets to make a turn with your ship. So in whatever Ooh, that's brutal. Is. Yeah. So, and those just represent all kinds of, that's just a simple way of representing all the stuff that would happen on the cards anyway. So, and just keeps it a little simpler and keeps the game flowing nicely and it's just less components to keep track of. So really nice. happy with how that's working out. And we simplified boarding a little bit. Boarding was really dicey back and forth, and now it's just kind of like it's you just once you get into combat, you can just roll, and then every hit, which is you get a twenty five percent chance on each die, and if you hit, you cause a point of fatigue, and then it gives it a little bit of back and forth because by the time you're into that range of boarding, it's unlikely you're going to knock a ship out in one boarding attempt unless you've really banged it up before. Right. I was going to say, because even like a, a, a ship of the line, right? Mm-hmm. This, there's so much crew. There's no way. It's just like, oh, I bought yeah. the ship. It's mine now. Yeah. Because so before <laughs> that was one, one of the problems I was able to fix. So if you had a if you had a pretty banged up galleon, you could say, or let's say a first rate, right? If it was banged up just enough, you could sail a sloop right up to it and just take it over. It's not, not so simple. Anymore. <laughs> right. Because that sloop's going to face hell to get there. <laughs> yeah. If it's, yeah. It's probably not going to get there. But <laughs> well, it depends. If you're playing against me, I'll miss that sloop with every shot, and you'll just take it in one. <laughs> yeah, well, but, that's uh, true. If you, if you just can't hit him, that's a different story. Of course. It's like you just got Korkleskied. But, uh, <laughs> so, awesome. And then, uh, obviously, new cards, uh, new new tactics. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. So, overall, like with all of the cards combined, how much are we talking about in that Kickstarter for those that go all in on everything? Oh, that's hard to say right now. So I've got a count somewhere. Uh, I could probably pull it up and look for it, but <laughs> it's going to take. Uh, yeah. It's going to be, so if we're able to get all the factions in that I'd like to do, let's see. So you're probably looking at roughly at least five cards per faction plus five generic cards. Um, five, 10, so 30 or so. Okay. 30 or so. It could go as high as 50 something. And that's just for the uh, initiative cards. Initiative right. cards, and that's one of my favorite parts of the game because that is that's kind of like the heart and soul of it for the most part. Because that's really it really focuses on what the game's about, which is an admiral's kind of perspective of the game. A lot of games, a lot of sailing games I've played, or have even looked into, not necessarily played every time, but it seems like the focus is almost like you're trying to be every captain at once. <laughs> And right. of every ship, and you're you're dealing with a lot of sailing min- minutia that um, that an admiral is not going to be concerned with. He's going to be more focused on <clears throat> ship's position in line and 
they're general facing to the wind, whether they're windward or or uh, whether they're windward or, or or sailing with the wind, sailing large, essentially, as we're calling in the game. Not technically the right term, but whatever, close enough. The um, excuse me, the so the cards represent an admiral meeting with his captains, creating a battle plan. And because you get to build that hand, every single card in that hand is there's no there's no like card that you always have to take. You can use whatever card you want. Is you just you can't take two of the same more than two of the same initiative value. So it gives you some limitations on how you build it. But all the cards that are either generic or available to your faction, you can use and build it however you want. So you've got some flexibility, and your opponent doesn't know what those cards are. So he doesn't necessarily know what your plans are, what, what you're capable of. Right. So you've executed them. And then some of them are one shots, like you talked about before. And that to me just really adds that that and that represents planning, signaling, uh, coordination, training, all kinds of stuff that in in a kind of neat abstract package that really gets I think the idea across, and a lot of national flavor is packed into those cards because certain so certain factured factions favored long range cannonading over boarding, or vice versa. You're going to see that reflected in their national cards, and it really lets you. And because they're always played a turn delayed, it kind of just represents kind of the chaos of battle and the delay of trying to communicate across the smoke and fog and everything that's happening. So to me, it's really what sets the game apart from other sailing games more than anything, is that it really just kind of drives uh, that idea of being the admiral of the fleet home. Right. Yeah, and I, I, that was one of the things I definitely liked because um, after after we talked a little bit at NashCon, I, I kind of looked in some, into some of the older sailing games, and a lot of them to me felt more kind of like classic battle tech with a ship instead of a mech. <laughs> yeah. That's like that, yeah. that that's i know that sounds very generic but it was the probably the best summary i could come up with right which mm. is which is great the problem with a lot of those games is that it really makes it difficult mm. to run more than two ships at a time yes and yes. and to me we so when i initially set out to make this game i had a lot i was like okay this game's gonna be focused on sailing mm. so i want to uh, or on the ships rather unlike blood and plunder which is a you know 50 50 split so i want to put more sailing detail into this but then when I kind of played it and started thinking about it, I was like, realistically, Blood and Plunder kind of already covers this, this kind of right. combat. You can easily run two ships in Blood and Plunder. And, and there's a lot. And, it, and it's going to be a lot more immersive experience because you're managing your crew and you're doing, you're maneuvering on the table and you're doing a lot, of, a lot more in-depth stuff that a captain is thinking about, right? It puts, really puts you in the captain's chair. Yes. Um, or seat or perspective, whatever. So... Whereas, so I, that's what made me realize, well, I don't, you know, this, I don't want to just make blood and plunder with smaller ships, right? Uh, I, I'm trying to do some, I want to do something different that conveys more of a fleet battle, which is the idea. It's kind of like more, if you, not that it's, not that it's blood and plunder like epic, but it is, that, that's almost the spirit behind it, if you will, even though it's, yeah. really, it's really a different game that they do share, obviously, some common concepts and they will have some tie in but they are two separate games too. Right. Awesome. So <clears throat> Kickstarter goes live November 7th. Now there's something that goes live on Monday that we also wanted to talk about, which Mike. is Mike, the quartermaster program. <laughs> Yay. Yay. So the quartermaster program is our, um, our volunteer program for people who are excited about the game and want to get more people involved, especially locally. Um, and it's our opportunity to work together with people like that to reward them t- for for um, spending time and <clears throat> giving back to the game community. Um, so what that's going to detail is basically we're going to – so traditionally these types of programs have been all about running stuff at stores. And we definitely want to push that. That's a super important component of this. But we also wanted to take it a little bit further. And a lot of places, a lot of people don't have they, that. A lot of people that are really excited about Blood and Plunder may just have a couple friends they play with, and they don't really have a local game store near them, or maybe not one that's interested in supporting Blood and Plunder, at least not yet. So, uh, the idea here is that if you want to do uh, battle reports online, uh, hobby guides like videos on how to paint and how to rig ships or things like that, so it's it's not just it's not just the presence in the store, but also in the online community, which I think these days is, is almost as important, right? They kind of build on each other these days. Yeah. 
because if you're you know if you're a local store and there's a bunch of cool web content out that's getting people excited about a game that's gonna at the end of the day help you move that game and get that product going in your store so to me it all ties together so we're gonna have the opportunity for people to, to support the game and be involved in different ways and they'll be rewarded for doing so with some free product um, and um, <clears throat> this is also going to tie in with our organized play and our tournament system, all of which will follow shortly after we start the program. So when we start, we're going to do it, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to have it limited. We're probably going to keep it to about 25, 20, 25 people for the first go, uh, just to make sure we didn't overlook something. You know, we've never run something like this. So we don't want to overwhelm ourselves. We want to make sure we keep it, we want to make sure it works. So we're going to get, we're going to select a few people and this will run till the end of the year. And then come January, we'll get, we're going to open it up to more people after we're sure that it's working right. Right. Awesome. So yeah, it's something I know you and I have talked about, you know, a little bit here and there on the side, but now that it's mm -hmm. official, we can talk about it out in the open and say, yes, right. Monday it starts. <laughs> right. Um, so with the breakdown on everything, um, because I've got the, I've kind of went through the packet a little bit. So like, really, you could get credit on multiple different ways. Like, there's right. the, the 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 blog posts, the videos, um, like in Nick's my case podcast. Um, yep. But then there's also like you 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 do it for demo days, tournaments, and organized play day at the store, right. um, convention events. So like, even if you know Firelock Games is not there on an official level, but you're running Blood and Plunder, exactly. all of that counts. Yep. It's just basically if you're doing something for the game, you're getting credit. Exactly. Yeah. That is the idea. Awesome. Yeah. So it's uh, it's definitely a, a, a slight change compared to how a lot of companies have done things in this past, the past, mm -hmm. especially with being able to do the blog posting. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, um, and obviously there's going to be you know some standards to that. You can't just write like, you can't just start a blog and write blood and plunder is awesome. And then say you submitted your blog post, so that's not going to cut it, obviously. But, <laughs> right. but at the same time, we don't expect you know we don't expect like uh, prize winning um, uh, journalism either. So as long as right. as long as you're putting the effort and you, you're making a nice presentation and doing doing something that's going to be helpful to the community or people interested in the game, it's gonna that's basically what we're looking for. So yeah, I was going to say you're you're a repeat offender to skirmish supremacy, and it's, if you're looking for prize winning journalism, <laughs> you have really set that bar low. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, obviously, this wouldn't qualify. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Professionally unprofessional, folks. Sammy, uh, you're fired. Yeah, just it, there. Yeah. The quality of the podcast just went up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then I know you got. You know, obviously with mentioning quartermasters and like, you know, we already kind of have the 20 to 25 people that'll be involved in this to make sure that it, that it gets fine tuned and is working and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, are you going to start rolling that out like a little bit this weekend? Like I know you're going to Crucible and then you have a couple other traveling things going on. Um, so no, the, so we're going to kind of roll the program out. Then probably in a couple of weeks, we're going to let release the tournament packet. Okay. Uh, and then I, I was hoping we'd have the organized play stuff ready by the end of this year, but I don't think it's going to happen at this point. It's just because there's so much printed components that go with it and there's painting from new models and stuff like that, that goes into it that hasn't really been totally done yet. So um, once that stuff's all done, I think at this point, be first sometime in the early first quarter of next year, we should see that roll out. But, uh, but it is coming, and and uh, it's going to be. And I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be really cool, and it's all going to tie in with everything else. And I think it's really exciting time to be getting into Blood and Plunder, or just to be playing Blood and Plunder if you are. So, and especially now with uh, and another thing we're going to start soon is some of our crowdfunding for local crowdfunding on our website. Uh, for some new units. So right. just once we hit a certain amount, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's 100. I think we need to get a hundred to 100 individual blisters pre-ordered or pledged for, I guess, on the thing. And then we say go, and the sculptor starts sculpting. And once he's done, we'll have the, we'll have the molds. And then that's um, turnaround time should not be anything like a typical one-year Kickstarter, but... More like uh, two months or so, roughly. 
Um, right. Maybe less, maybe more. Just depends on the difficulty of getting the sculpts done. The pikemen should be pretty straightforward since it's using a lot of assets we already have, like the pikes and uh, or the lances for lanceros because that's how they'll be armed. Um, we'll have it no, 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 no. I want, I want the the either the Jewish or the Scottish militia first. But we already have that. Well, you have counts as. <laughs> I want their own personal models. We got to do first. We're going to do the ones that don't have models in the pictures. They just have drawings or no picture <laughs> at all. Some of the characters. Then, then, then we can start looking into other things too. But uh, first, right. we got to cover those the ones that have no model choices at all. So, such as, I mean, the pikemen are kind of close because you could use lancetos, but a lot of people don't want to do that. So, right. No, they want their pikemen to have helmets. Damn it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so awesome. And of, of course, the pikemen are going to be generic. Um, so they can right. be used with any faction that has access to pikemen. Correct. Um, which is the only reason we didn't do the warriors first, because I think that's one of the ones that's most needed. But it's for a specific faction. So those I'm going to, I'm mm-hmm. going to wait and see first and try to do some that I think will be a little more widespread on up in popularity. So yes. because I'm, I'd really like to see the warriors and the court of law and Canadian militia and a bunch of really cool units like that. So. Yeah. And then uh, I know that at one point you and I were chatting about, you know, the possibility. And again, folks don't quote, this is like hard proven, <laughs> like it's going to happen, but like maybe using this to do like more North American natives. Yes. That would be awesome. I would love to do that. But um, again, it just depends on how popular the program goes. I mean, if we get this sucker funded in the first day or something, that's going to be great. And then, yeah, then that's, I would signal that as a major success for the program, and you can just uh, we'll just start pumping stuff out. There's no reason to stop at that point. So, right, exactly. You know, at that <laughs> point, you're like, well, okay, damn it, let's just do the warriors next week. Uh, we've, <laughs> we've lined up a couple different sculptors so that we can kind of shift without having so one won't delay the other because it'll be different people working on it. So right. if we can just we could literally you know in, in like a, a week after that after that one gets done we could probably jump to the next one. So which is pretty exciting. Obviously you want to give people a chance to recuperate if the need be, but <laughs> right. Maybe do one every other month, month or something. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was Let thinking, recover. Probably, I wouldn't mind trying to do it monthly, but it would, um, cause you know, especially once we get into more specific faction ones, then I don't think it'll be as hot as something that anybody can use. Right. So like for like the natives, that's very specific, obviously. So, yeah. Yeah, well, and I, th- I think like reaching for the 100 to 120, you know, like, you know, pre ordered blisters is a good way to go because, like, at the end of the day, most folks, you know, again, for the most part, most folks mm-hmm. are already picking up, like, you know, if, if you're looking at it from bl- a blister of four, right? Most right. folks get at least two blisters of a unit in yeah. some way, shape, or form. Especially cheapy guys like the Pikeman, you're, you're going to want two or three at least. Yeah. Right. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I, I know I have, you know, at least two blisters of absolutely everything. Me too. Yeah. Well, Why the difference you is you own the company. <laughs> he just goes to the back and goes, I'm going to take this. <laughs> the, the only thing I don't have yet is, uh, is the Dutch. Uh, I, I have not, I have not purchased Dutch yet. Cool. The Dutch are a lot of fun. The Dutch were the, surprisingly the natives have overtaken the Dutch now in sales, which is cool. I, so many people, we did not get a lot of requests for the natives early on, but I, I just wanted to put them in there for the sake of completion. I've learned they're super important, obviously, to the, the whole setting and the, oh, yeah. and the history. So so I was like, oh, I'm going to put them in there. The Dutch, though, people asked for like crazy. So I thought that was going to be like a huge seller right like out of the gate. Like it, They did well in the Kickstarter, but outside of the Kickstarter, they waned a little bit compared to the Native Americans. I mean, they're still selling well, but... The Native Americans have been like the hot seller, which is surprising to me. I was like, that's awesome. Nobody asked for that, and all of a sudden, everybody wants it. <laughs> Every, everyone <laughs> wants Chief Squatty Potty. Yeah, that's what it yeah. is. That one mall. <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as we've come to know it on the Blood and Plunder page, Poop and Neil. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that, and then and then you do have, you know, ha- have this guy who's, you know, got his hand pointed out, you know, and he's, mm-hmm. he's all partying. You a little know, bit of YMCA going on there. 1980s, you know, little uh, visor going on. Except made of gold, so it's classier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and probably weighs like 10 pounds on your skull. But, you know, hey, let's not go into detail. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, you know, honestly, I even at 100-point games, I've been playing natives and um, – r- 
a lot of people, I think, just like if they're if they're used to playing like your typical kind of colonial gun line, right. for the first few games, they start saying, oh, the natives are broken or things yeah. like that, at least what I've noticed, yeah. until you realize that most natives also have this beautiful thing called Sound of Thunder. They don't know what a <laughs> gun is, and so therefore, they it freaks them the hell out. Well, they know what a gun is. I just don't want to get hit by it. It's <laughs> right. <really stupid. laughs> because even the natives that have guns have sound of thunder. Yeah. <laughs> and slow to reload because they still don't know what all this powder thing is. But, uh, yeah, it's because like, I've uh, I played uh, quite a few games with the natives so far. And I've had some people say, like, whoa, these are broken until they play them like the third, fourth, fifth time. Then they're like, yeah. oh, OK, now they're not so bad. Yeah, Basically, play- I just need to not stand here and get fatigued to death. Yeah, if you've played a lot of Blood and Plunder and all of a sudden you find yourself up against the natives or even playing the natives, you're, it's it's surprising because they are so dramatically different that it's hard to deal with them at first if you're not ready for them. But they're definitely not broken. Yeah. I've um, As um, the last game I played, I just I had a – I mean, I just crushed my brother. He was playing with the natives, and, man, it was bad. I think I lost, like, two models. So uh. – <laughs> You do got to push them hard. That's the thing is you can't you can't just sit there and try to shoot it out with them because they're just going to disappear and and yeah and just peg peg away too slowly and then and then and then come in and break your face when you're fatigued out. Yeah. So they're not you can't just, you just can't get into a shooting fight with them. You got to shoot them and then and then advance. Shoot them and advance, and that's the way you deal with them. Right. And they will. Yeah. I was going to say the one thing that a lot of people I don't think realize about the natives because a lot of people look at Blood and Plunder is again like a gun line game. Right. You know, fighting happens, but it doesn't happen too, too often unless it's like a unit of sailors that like run into wreck, you know, right. like freebooters or something like that. Yeah. Um, but natives, their their fight defense, like their fight's pretty good, but their fight defense is like an eight. Yeah. So like hitting them in melee combat, they melt. Yep. They did not like to fight in those prolonged. They like to they like to strike. They like to strike you hard and then disappear right. or hit you when you're down and just finish you off. But they were not interested in prolonged fighting. That's that was not to their advantage. So yes, even though they knew the lay, lay of the land and everything else, getting caught in it is a different story altogether. Right. Yeah. Which is why. Which is why they're they're tricky too. There's some. Uh, I don't know if it came out this week, but because we did some extra videos with Beast of War, but there was one where the, Justin came up on Kai, and he was like, "All right, I finally got him." Kai just shoot him to pieces. He's trying to fight him. He's like, "All right, I'm going to charge him," and then he charged him, and Kai just backs away. He's like, "No, I'm good." <laughs> I'm not gonna fight you right now. <laughs> so that's one of like that, that's one of my favorite rules. That's just <laughs> the natives that cunning where they're like, nope, just back <laughs> off. <And> they just <laughs> they're like, yeah, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Let's go ahead and back up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh man, yeah. So I mean, overall, like all all the new stuff. Like I haven't received a lot of mine yet. Uh, but I know Nick has, so like the flute, have, Nick, have you had a chance to play a game with the flute yet and like really see what that thing can do? No, no. I, uh, I broke it out for a game. I, I gave a, you know, I went and gave, uh, some demos and I was, uh, I was playing on this Island and I had the flute sitting off of it. Um, the so. thing to remember about the flute is that if you're on the poop deck, you actually on most ships, you're shooting down from a height advantage. Mm. that's one of the biggest advantages of the flute. And then if you can throw, if you slap some fighting tops on there, which by the way, I'm going to have some, that's a new thing coming soon. That'll be on the website is some, uh, if I have my sample here. Let's see. Uh, no, I think I put it somewhere else. Anyway, it's uh it's a nice little two piece fighting top. So if you have an existing rig, you can just kind of pop it right into what's there and take it off. If you're not going to use it. Okay, so. good. That that was actually going to be my question. Is that something that you could just like slide on there or slide yep. off? So that okay. Mm-hmm. So you put a fighting top on there, and you get the poop deck. You can actually do a lot of shooting down at people, which is always good. Take away that that cover bonus that ships give you. Right. And really wreck people coming at you in canoes and boats. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like natives. Yeah. Because natives on a, a, a fleet of canoe by natives like boarding your boat usually yeah. ends in bad times it's pretty difficult to deal with yeah i will say that it's it's <laughs> those are some of the funner games we would we got through in play testing so it's fun we did uh, i think we did like a 600 point game just like let's try something crazy high and then we just did a galleon against a fleet of piraguas and canoes 
And I, it was, <laughs> I was playing with John. I think I sank two Piraguas and like three canoes, but he still boarded me. And got me he had that many. <laughs> he's had that many guys left. <laughs> You're just like, ah, oh, victory! Damn it! <laughs> I've got, awesome. I've got this bad guy, bad boy to work on. Oh, the football! <laughs> no, 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 no! The flute would be a football. This, this is, this is a whole lot more than a football. How you liking the model? I, uh, I like the model. It is absolutely massive. There is a ton of cannons on it, and for uh, all of you people who can't see what I'm holding up to the camera, it's, it's the galleon. Yeah, that's right. This is not typically a video thing. Right? Yes, <laughs> right, right. So, so I'm well, holding up like the galleon, now. and this thing is absolutely massive. Um. I, it looks it looks bigger than you from this perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, you know, hold it up and it's it is, you know from from end to end it's it's bigger across than my chest, so it's about two feet. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's it is a big ship. Um I think the in- most interesting part is that it doesn't have any any cannons other than the ones that you just you mount straight to the hull, right? Yeah, which, and it's a good is... thing. And it's a good thing I did that too, because when I I said let me, this is going to be tricky to cast. Last thing we need is more stuff to get hung up on. So <laughs> oh no, definitely. <laughs> I I could I could believe that all day. Not an easy ship to cast at all. It was. They're they are slow to make, but it's but they're they're awesome. Okay, I'm really happy with how they turned out in the end. It took a lot of different tries and a lot of different methods, but at the end we figured it out. <laughs> yeah, I know, Nick. I, you're still planning on having that one ready to go, at least you know, primed and get the basic painting done uh, for the uh, the historical game day at Gigabytes on November 10th, right? Yep. Sweet. That will be a good showpiece for sure. It always draws a crowd whenever it's out. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was funny the the day I bought it at Gigabytes, you know, after I I kind of committed to having a stupid galleon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I I I brought it out and I set it on the table, and you know, there's even some people who are interested in the game, except for they're like, oh, but it's a pirate game, and I don't like pirates, and and they're like, but I do like that ship. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a pirate game, technically. That's just what the marketing people want to tell you. Yeah, I know, and that's that's <laughs> what I keep telling them. I'm like, you can play all of these factions that I'm like, there's really only a very minor amount. Everyone else was privateers. It was legal, right? <laughs> or in- you could even play the you know the pirate hunters who may once have been pirates themselves, but you know. They, they, even, they just, even in the game presently, pirates and privateers are actually outnumbered by uh, conventional and militia forces. Yeah, no, <laughs> well, I know, and and that's what that I, is. that's what I keep oh, telling. <laughs> but you know, they they really are just you know trying not to get into another game. I'm slowly wearing them away. And this week, <laughs> you mentioning Barbary pirates and U.S. Uh, Navy and Marines. You know, he was like, hmm. Yeah, I I've always told um, I've always told people that I feel like there's a lot of I feel like there's a lot of especially historical gamers that kind of just scoff at anything because it's got because it's a uh, pirate related. With uh, understandably, I can't fault them. There's a lot. There's been a lot of even even games by historical companies that have been you know quote unquote pirate games have not been really that historical at all. And haven't really done justice to, um, to the way to the reality of it, you know, which is something that um, I think will start to be communicated more as we get more into the 18th century, and as we break down some of our releases, and especially the latter half of the 18th century, where you start to get into the uh, the final French and Indian War and the American Revolution, and as we start touching on those things, I think we'll start to hit some more common popular historical themes that will. That will uh, that will really start to get the historical gamers' attention more, right? Because we've even kind of heard that even from the, the the folks that are in Blood and Plunder now. They're like, "Oh, well, where's Anne Bonny and Mary Read?" And we're like, "Well, yeah. we're not quite to that point yet." <laughs> yes, I've, we have the common problem of we're not piratey enough for some people, and we're too piratey for others. 
Too, yes. too yeah. We walked the middle line too well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which that's that's what I'm here to do to dispel that rumor. It is we we hit we're doing all those things, and we're giving them the proper we're giving them the proper uh, representation, historical accuracies and tactics, especially historical tactics, are rewarded in Blood and Plunder, which is always the goal of a historical game. And if you but at the same time, if you just want to sit around with your friends and say yar at each other, and roll dice, you can totally do that too. Yeah. Yar. I mean, you know, it's just fun to do no matter what. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't get a lot of people to play Blood and Plunder. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, it's it's one of those it's one of those things that like I actually had a talk with uh, a couple of folks over at uh, Meeple Madness the other night when I was running Blood and Plunder up there, and they were like, "Well, yeah, this is a pirate game," and I'm like, "No, actually, it's a colonial game disguised as a pirate game." Um, <laughs> there's really very few pirates in the game. As a matter of fact, you only have one character in the game that is an actual, actual pirate. pirate. <laughs> That's true, actually, yeah. Just one. Just one. Lots like, of guys Brent, who Brent are accused the of piracy. Pirates. Yeah, lots of guys who are accused of piracy, especially by the Spanish, or by yeah. the Juan Corso, the English would call him a pirate, but he was a privateer. So it's like, yeah. the totally legal. Yeah. <laughs> Although they, when I, well, I don't know about totally legal, but, you know, they had a certain amount of legality that yeah. pirates certainly did not have. <laughs> <laughs> right. Spain just kind of looked the other way on that one. They're like, oh, Juan Corso again? Yeah, so anyway, were, what were we doing? They were just, the Spain's more like, well, who cares? They've, we're tired of all this piracy crap from the English. Let's give them a little bit of a taste of their own medicine. Yeah, yeah bend the rules a little bit, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and, I, you know, I was explaining it to someone at one point, and I'm like, and then you had the, you know, had those times where, you know, England and Spain might get along, so you, all of a sudden you had a bunch of people going over to, you know, the French colonies going, hey, I see that you have a Spanish problem. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know I shot at you last week, but that was a mistake. <laughs> yeah. Do you mind if I go shoot them? Will you give me a piece of paper that says I can go shoot them? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. That. That so it boils it down, yeah. <laughs> simple mechanics and a little bit of that old world racism but uh <laughs> I, I think it was uh blue water empire that i uh that i read mm-hmm. it, you know in there it'd be like you know oh these people are getting along these people aren't but these people didn't get the message that these people were getting along <laughs> so they were still shooting at them until they did get the message and then they went and talked to these people who didn't like these people and then they just kept shooting it's, it's a long boat ride from uh, Europe to the world so messages travel slow <laughs> welcome to the world without internet <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean we were supposed to stop shooting them they're all dead now oops <laughs> Well, I guess technically it's true. We stopped shooting them now. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have any problems with them anymore. <laughs> we settled it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So one of the other things I need to know, too, since we're talking like flavor stuff, if I am playing the Dairen and I kill Francois Lollinay in close combat, mm-hmm. and I say that I eat him, do I get bonuses? No. Well, they didn't actually eat anybody, so... But the other, uh, the the ones who were the ones that ate, I don't remember now. I think it was the mosquito uh, guys. But no, I mean once he's dead, once he's once he's dead, eating him doesn't help you because I mean the game's over. So, <laughs> uh, so so I, for I, I can't people. even go for historical accuracy. So uh, so one of the one of the guys that's playing Middle Earth uh, SBG is. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he's picked up a bunch of corsairs, and so you know he was he was talking paint schemes, and he posted this one where the corsair looks a lot like Henry Morgan, you know, like the Captain Morgan for uh, rum, you know, you know paint scheme, and he's like, oh yeah, you know, I, I want to you know paint him like this, you know, something fierce. So then I'm like, oh, you want fierce or you know, and intimidating here, here here seems more fitting for a bunch of corsairs. And I sent him Lolane, and he and a bunch of the other guys were just like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's um, he's a strange guy. 
That's for sure. <laughs> He Not was just for regular understood. <laughs> yeah, for his his so for those of you that are wondering what we're talking about, Francois Lalanne was as we like to coin it the original American Psycho, and um, yeah, how long did he last in like the, the, you know if you want to call it the heavy quotations your piracy? It was what six years total I don't before even he was killed. Long. I don't even think that long. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. But I think it was only like I think he was only active for like two, maybe three years. Uh, he he had several close calls, and he finally, you know, met his end. Yeah, <laughs> trying to sneak into Nicaragua. So <laughs> yeah, and the natives actually like ripped him limb from limb in a fire pit. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then burnt him. You know, just because they were like, "Oh hell no, there is no <laughs> chance this dude is coming back." Yeah, um, they probably kept... peed on him too. But you know, they're not going to write that back then because it's you know improper. Well, no, actually, to... uh, uh, I was going to say I, I I thought that they. Uh, they burnt him, like burnt you know all of his limbs like individually, and threw the dust into the wind to get rid of it. Or so a lot, of, a lot of accounts say that they roasted him and ate him in a ceremonial fashion. So I mm-hmm. doubt they would have peed on him if they were going to eat him. So. Sterilize the demon it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I know is that they're eating another human being. They're probably like, you know what, whatever. I don't have any <laughs> lemon juice. This works. But uh, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so it, stuff like that, like, is, is the stuff that you know Nick and I have talked about it numerous times. Like, that's the stuff we really like about the game, and I, I think that if we could get, I guess, if you want to call it like more of the real history out there, I think it would attract a lot more people to the game. You know, like really kind of, yep. you know, in, in you know, kind of going back to the quartermaster thing for the quartermasters out there, you know, doing some of the research on like, you know, that truth is always stranger than fiction. Uh-huh. And where everybody, when they think pirates, they think pirates of the Caribbean, and then like show them what it was really like right. back then. Like Henry Morgan was not like some great admiral; he was more along the lines <laughs> of like a privileged dude, bro. They got really lucky a lot of times. <laughs> well, Henry Morgan couldn't sail for the <laughs> for the life of him. <laughs> he got drunk and blew up his own ship. Hey, we don't know that it randomly exploded while he was on it. Yeah, I doubt he personally blew it up, but he certainly, I mean, it was his <laughs> ship, so I guess it was his responsibility at the end of the day, right? Exactly. So, um, no, but exactly. <clears throat> That's part of the quartermaster uh, program, or more, more specifically, um, the uh, organized play program is going to focus on a lot of that. So it's going to have, it's going to be focused on history and different historical battles and events. And of course, we're going to start out with a little bit of more of a piratical one which is the South Seas crews of um, Dampierre and Sharp and, and Coxon and all those guys uh, where, they, where they go. <clears throat> They're like, well, we can't raid in the Caribbean anymore, so let's just go to the Pacific side and they cross Panama to try to recreate Morgan's raid, but there's nothing left in Panama, which they discover to their great sadness. And uh, <laughs> then they just start cruising around South America on the, on the Pacific coast, causing all kinds of mayhem. But it's a super interesting story because there's like four, three or four different guys who kept uh, really detailed logs of everything that was happening and kept journals and stuff. And uh, I know, I know, um, uh, uh, I know for sure Dan Pierre kept a journal. I believe Sharp had an account. Um, man, there was an, I blanking out for some reason now, but there was a bunch of guys who actually. So it's a really well documented, and the Spanish kept good documents on it too. So you got both perspectives. Uh, really well documented uh, um, um, uh, campaign, I guess you'd call it, and super interesting. And there's a lot of new characters that are going to come out of it that'll be in there. So it's going to get deep into the history, take you through different battles, and that's how it's going all going to be set up. And um, <clears throat> Nate Zettel, who's the guy who worked on our campaign, is uh, is currently putting it together for us, and he's doing an excellent job. I'm super excited to. There's going to be models to represent the characters. There's going to be new cards to represent them. There's going to be a, a, a booklet with all the scenarios and everything. So we are trying to uh, illustrate that history as much as we can. And we did our first historical scenario with Little Nay recently. There will be more of those coming as uh, down the pipe pretty soon. Uh, probably expect the next one, uh, if I can, the, with the Oak and Iron prep for the Kickstarter, we may not get to one this month, but uh, certainly you can expect one in November. Okay, awesome. Great. Well, is there anything else you want to throw in there, Mike, before we wrap this thing up? 
Um, nope, just check out uh, Oak and Iron, Oak and Iron Game .com. And if you are interested in checking it out, it's going to launch November 7th on Kickstarter, as we said. There's an opportunity there to sign up uh, for the newsletter so you can get a reminder. If you don't want to forget, get in, get in early. And uh, there's also a video that we did with Beast of War on there so you can check out the gameplay. It's a little bit of early gameplay. Excuse me. A little bit of early gameplay, but it still gives you very much the idea of the game. There's not a whole lot changed. We did change from the D6 to the D8, but ultimately you could get a good feel of how the game plays and works. And, and just keep watching Firelock Games on Facebook and on our website as we're going to be putting, we're going to try to start doing a lot more um, content locally here, uh, battle reports and things of that nature. So just keep awesome. an eye out for everything coming. Great. Nick, anything else you want to throw on there? Um, so ev anyone who, you know, is, is getting into this, don't, don't travel with any of your stuff. I've done it twice now. And every time I've done it, well, you know, that, that being twice, I've always gotten stopped by TSA and searched <laughs> fly a lot. I work for Delta. I, I fly a lot l lately and no problems other than when I have something blood and plunder related. You know, I've traveled lots with blood and plunder related stuff too, and I've never been bothered. In well, fact, yeah. people ask, people talk to you about it. They think it's really cool. They're like, hey, what are these little soldiers in your bag? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. They, uh, you know, most most people find that interesting. Mm -hmm. um, they just, they don't like, you know, pirate ships in your bag for some reason. <laughs> they get really interested in whatever the hell that is. <laughs> I've got, I had a, I took two galleons carry on one time. I didn't get bothered at all. They didn't even care. Like, whatever. Just pass it along. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's just you. I think it's something you're doing. But don't put this be. on my on our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't, don't put it on you. I mean, you know, Tim. Tim can attest. You know, I, I was going through uh, in in Chicago and got stopped. What is this? It's a pirate ship. <laughs> oh, well, we understand that, but what is this Derringer duct taped to the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> Were you wearing some kind of offensive T-shirt or something? Maybe. <laughs> nope. Actually, the best part with that one was, you know, I, I said, yeah, yeah, it's the pirate ship in the bottom. And like the guy finally is like, yep, there is a pirate ship in the bottom. And he went to put stuff back and people were like, no, we've been standing here for like 20 minutes. We want to see the pirate ship. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, actually I think the first time that happened, he was right when we got into the game at Adepticon. Yeah. I got through security, no problem. Then all of a sudden I noticed Nick stopped and they're going through his pirate ship. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, most recently I had the, uh, the no piece beyond the line book and they're like, this is a really big book. Why are you <laughs> running around with a really big book? I'm like, because it's a pirate book. <laughs> You could just you could just say you're religious, then they'll just let you go. Like, oh, <laughs> just, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> I'm going Whoops. to Florida. Yeah. I'm bringing a pirate book. I mean, <laughs> that just seems to go hand in hand together, people. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode of Skirmish Supremacy. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at Tim at SkirmishSupremacy.com or Nick at SkirmishSupremacy.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>